So we're here again in person. Hey, yeah. I like this. I mean, because you're cool or whatever, but also because it's an easier <laughs> edit for me. <laughs> yeah, no, that comes first and foremost. Podcasts, then personal relationships. Yes, obviously. We can't talk unless we record it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> No, I was getting out of my car and I was thinking, because I had brought lunch, I'm like, this is going to be fun. I've got McDonald's. We're about to talk about communism. And then I'm going home with a new cat. Oh, Those are like some of my yeah. favorite things is food, communism, and cats. Yes, it'll be great. You're going to get a little black cat mm. who showed up. He just showed up here <laughs> one day. There was a storm and he ran in. Yeah, so I'm <laughs> we excited. have too many already. <laughs> So here you go. I'm excited. Yeah. I've been angling for a second cat for many years, so this is a big moment. <laughs> All right. Well, you'll love him. He's an idiot. I love that. So <laughs> I love that for him and for me. Okay. Cool. All right. Before I get this cat, though, I have to... This is my reward for, for being a good student, is I get a cat, right? Uh, yeah. So you have to be a good student or else we're taking him to the shelter. Fuck. Okay. L high pressure. I better take <laughs> notes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Let's Today, do it. we're going to learn about the Spanish Civil War. Okay, this guy, this fucking guy. Yeah, do you remember which episode it was we talked about this before, like, number-wise? I know it was the Goldman episode. Yeah, so that's episode 14. We talk about Emma Goldman. The early days. The early days, yeah. I had to scroll <laughs> back way further than I thought. <laughs> We've mentioned it in other ones, too, though. Um, yes. Can we start with me telling you what I know, which is almost nothing? Sure, yeah. Here's what I know. All right. I know a lot of cool art came out of it. <laughs> like in my art appreciation class, we talked about it. And like there's this mm -hmm. guy who like went around and did etchings of all the violence. And like that's how people got the news about it. And it was crazy. Oh, cool. I mean, obviously Picasso's Guernica mm -hmm. was about that. And yeah, that's basically all well, you know. That's It's not a lot. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and, oh, Hemingway. He was Hemingway there. was there. All the writers were like, this seems cool, which it was, yeah. I would not do, but okay. It was kind of a cause celeb, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. All right, starting from scratch. All right, yeah. Blank slate. Fill it in. Start with why learn about the Spanish Civil War. It's, you know, for one, a key event in the history of the anti-fascist, the anarchist, the socialist, the communist movements worldwide. Cool. It's also kind of a... Prelude to, some people call it kind of a dress rehearsal for World War II. Okay, yeah. Because uh, it happens from 1936 to 1939. And obviously there's going to be some lessons, once we get into it, some lessons to learn for the left. As yeah. As far as what went on there. And also this history is barely taught at all in the United States. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like super significant. For one, there was a fascist or like at least kind of fascist light. Mm -hmm. dictatorship in Western Europe for a long time, almost 40 years. Jesus, really? Yeah. It lasts Fuck. until 1975. Okay, we all know about like fascism as it relates to Nazis, but like we never talk about Spanish fascism. That's so weird. Mm -hmm. It's because the good guys were communists probably, huh? Uh, well, the good guys in the sense that... The not fascists? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, from the American... Yeah, so yes, they were communists. Or, you know, they had a lot of communist support. Yeah. So, uh, many people died in the violence of the Spanish Civil War. Really, a lot of trouble in terms of coming up with the the exact numbers and everything. But around five hundred thousand, half a million Jeez. killed in total. Okay. Um, that's kind of why to get into you know okay, some yeah. of the big pictures. It's a big deal. Yeah. Starting background history of Spain because you don't know anything about Spain. I don't. Right? I okay. don't. I know that as a Mexican, I have to kind of hate them. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Just on a personal ancestral level, but uh, yeah, that's all I know. They have, to me, a very weird accent, just because I grew up learning Mexican Spanish, so. Yeah, so I will sometimes basically try to use that for people's names, mm -hmm. uh, not so much for locations and stuff, because yeah. they hard. also have normal location names for me, so <laughs> that's what I'll try to do. Okay, cool. It will probably be bad, but whatever. Let's do it. <laughs> all right, background history of Spain before the... Second Spanish Republic, which is when the Civil War will happen. So this okay. is before 1931. Spain had a constitutional monarchy from 1812 till 1931. They had like a brief little window besides that, but all throughout that time you had growing problems, economic, mm -hmm. social, political crises. Economically, they were lagging behind 
pretty much the rest of Europe. They were less industrialized. In agriculture, they still had like a latifundia system. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you remember those are like the like the few huge landlords. It's kind of a plantation day. system. Yeah, basically. Okay. Widespread poverty uh, in terms of social problems. They had widespread illiteracy, poverty, inequality. Workers, whether they were industrial or agricultural, were treated like crap. So, I mean, this is a big question. Was there a reason for that? I'm sure there are many reasons for that. But, like, why were they kind of behind the rest of Europe? Uh, they were still uh, more semi-feudal. So, like, the aristocracy mm -hmm. had a lot more power. So it was kind of like corruption in that sense of, like, they were just like, ah, I'm in fucking palaces and shit and y'all are serfs or whatever. In a way, it's kind of what we talked about in the... We touched on it in open veins mm -hmm. when they said, like, when the gold and everything from the New World came back to Spain, it just, oh, like, yeah. passed through, right? And went to the European, like, financiers of everything. Yeah, they owed a lot of money to basically everybody else in Europe. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, this is kind of the the end of that, Yeah. Right? Uh, they had a lot of labor unrest. There's, like, repeated strikes. They get crushed by the government. Shit. Yeah, there's a lot going on, but not enough time to get into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but suffice it to say, this leads to the growth of major trade unions like the Socialist uh, UGT. Okay. General Union of Workers. Okay, got it. And so I'll give like the English name for all these because they are just translations. And okay. there's no need to yeah. bog down in it. And the Anarcho-Syndicalist CNT, which is the National Confederation of Labor. Okay, cool. All right. So, listeners, <laughs> I have been given a handout for this episode. That's how much fucking content there is. A list of abbreviations, basically, in all the groups. So, if you're a Patreon <laughs> supporter, you will also get these. Uh, yeah, it's very handy, I think, because you'll, you will still be bringing up the UGT and CNT way on down the line. So. Okay, okay. CNT is anarcho-syndicalist. Mm -hmm. UGT is just, like, socialist. Right. So, okay. the CNT is also affiliated with the militant group FAI, which is the Iberian Anarchist Federation. Okay. And also the International Labor Federation called AIT, the International Workers Association. Okay. The only reason I bring that up is because a lot of times in like propaganda from the era, mm -hmm. posters and stuff, you'll see CNT with like CNT FAI or CNT FAI. Yeah, I think I've seen that uh, in our, I think in our Emma Goldman episode, I like looked into some of those, yeah. They're all affiliated, but that's where that comes from. Okay, okay. Um, it's maybe confusing if you're just like, what? What is this? <laughs> uh, meanwhile, the UGT, so the socialist guys, mm -hmm. they were affiliated with the Democratic Socialist uh, PSOE, which is the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party. Okay. Sometimes I'll just call them the Socialist Party because it's short. That's shorter. fine. Makes sense. So basically you got socialists, you got anarchists. <laughs> right, yeah. And they all kind of spring up around this time and start doing stuff, right? Cool. Anarchism, by the way, was mo way more popular in Spain than in the rest of Europe. Really? Yeah, it's very active, especially in Catalonia and Andalusia. Mm -hmm. It got its start there in 1868 from a guy. A guy, okay. <laughs> Giuseppe Finelli. Okay. Uh, he was an Italian. He was recruiting for the first international. Okay. So the like international organization of, of at that time, anarchist, communist. Yeah, everybody. yeah. He was spreading this, what became to be called La Idea. Oh, just the, the, the big idea. idea. Yeah. Okay, and, ideas uh, man over here. Right, yeah, and they were spreading it, but it's a long story too, but basically it was a big deal. Okay, saying, yeah. Compared to the other places, which kind of developed in a more socialist Okay, tradition. so he, he was the prophet of anarchism. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Political problems, they had a ton of coups okay. in that time period before 1931. They had, for example, 12 between 1814 and 1874. Jesus, <laughs> it's a little bit like French Revolution, I feel like. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And liberals, you know, were fighting it out with conservatives in, in their parliament, in the Cortes. Mm -hmm. But they weren't really, like, solving problems so much as finding a way to prop up the state, basically. Yeah, yeah. They are just putting band-aids on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, he, the, the liberals are for, like, the kind of the bourgeois, mm -hmm. uh, the rising merchant class. It's a classic, classic division there. <laughs> Mokdiv is playing with a toy. Listeners, we've got cat toys out here. and She doesn't have to have that. <laughs> she, yeah, we can fix this. Let's do that. They were also helped by the church, the Catholic church, which was very powerful in Spain. Oh, okay. So I thought you meant the anarchists were, and I was like, wait a minute. No. Okay, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're going to have to explain that one to me. The state. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, gotcha. The liberals, the conservatives, they were helped by the Catholic church, mm -hmm. was on their side, enforcing everything, really. 
and this kind of spurs a feeling of anti-clericalism. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's a big current in revolutionary tendencies in Spain and throughout Latin America, really. Yeah, I was about to say that it's a super common thing. And uh, that's really interesting to me because you do have like religious socialist movements, but like it's interesting that they're common adversaries as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spain was also losing its empire. Uh, it lost Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam in the Philippines in 1898, in the Spanish-American War. And it was fighting desperately to keep a hold of Morocco in 1920 uh, through 1926. That was called the Rif War. So, oh no, baby lost his toys. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of falling apart in that way. <laughs> and all this to say is basically old monarchical Spain was bad. It was having mm -hmm. some problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, its last monarch before the Republic was a guy named King Alfonso the Thirteenth. Okay. And he was not very good. Okay, great. <laughs> not a good candidate for the new cat's name. Got it. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> he was bad at, like, prosecuting the Rift War. And in 1923, I mean, this got so bad, people thought, oh, we're going to lose this, that the army did a coup against him. Or against his government, not against him. Okay. Uh, they did a coup and put in place a dictatorship. Ooh. Under a guy named Miguel Primo de Rivera. Okay. And this is... So it's like in parliament, like he was a dictator in parliament, but like okay. the king was still in charge and he supported it. He was like, go ahead, dude, like okay. save us. Yeah. <laughs> and they were able to win that war with French help and keep things together for a bit. But eventually that guy was also bad, mm. messed stuff up and got run out. Okay. And by this point, everybody's like, dude, Alfonso, like you supported this asshole. <laughs> You know, this sucks. And so, like, the left wing, the right wing, no, everyone hates everyone this guy at this okay. point. And, and they declare, they have an election where, like, liberals and socialists and stuff, like, everyone on the left kind of wins a majority enough. Republican ideas win. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, we're going to have a republic. Okay. They declare the Second Spanish Republic in 1931. And the military tells Alfonso, you need to go. See you later. Yeah. And okay. he leaves. What was the first Spanish Republic? Did I miss that? No, that was the blip that I mentioned before. Oh, okay. I didn't really gotcha. get into it, but that was from 1873 to 74. Very okay. short-lived. Mm, not like that a important. Year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was, it was a, a one weird school year. We all tried something <laughs> different. Yeah, it was kind of a hiccup. It okay, been, okay. They were not prepared. <laughs> okay, great. So that's, yeah, that's a good point, though. That's Try why it's again. called the Second Spanish Republic. <laughs> Here's the deal. We just laid out kind of right. All these working people, they want big changes. Mm -hmm. They've been wanting them for a long time. They want land reform. They want union rights. They just want some relief from like the boots on their necks, right? Yeah, yeah. Anarchists, especially like the CNT that we mentioned, they mm -hmm. said, you know, this republic, it's not enough. This is not a worker state. This is not us controlling the means of production. Yeah. What is this, right? Meanwhile, you had like conservative, traditionalist, kind of reactionary elements or monarchy, mm -hmm. pro monarchy elements that are like, this is crazy, you know? They hated kind of this whole move. Yeah. So you had kind of opponents on both sides from the get go. Yeah. What the Republic decides to try to do is kind of chart a moderate course between that. Okay. Right? That's got to be smart, right? Well, they start out, they make a new constitution, <laughs> and they have a, yeah, they have kind of a liberal. I've learned anything uh, from West Wing. It's you gotta gotta listen to everyone's opinion and then make everyone upset by going in the middle. By being right. <laughs> by being right. Just be, just be the smartest person. Actually, sorry, the smartest man. <laughs> yeah, definitely the smartest man. <laughs> uh, we should do an episode on that once. Oh, one time. God, yes. I don't know. That we shouldn't inflict that on our listeners, maybe. <laughs> so they they form this kind of liberal quasi-democratic socialist government okay. uh, under the moderate leftist prime minister, Manuel Athania. Okay. And they introduced some kind of moderate changes, very, very much too moderate and too slow okay. to help people enough. So this is enough, though, to piss off the right. So oh, gosh, what yeah. What are you doing? You know, like they're telling us, you know, uh, the, the people's commissar, Joe Biden, is ruining everything now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's kind of what they were doing to these guys. Okay. But it's, of course, not enough to satisfy the left. Yeah. Right? So here are some examples of some of these reforms. Mm, military reform. Okay. Uh, the military, they didn't want it to get out of control. I mean, they ha had had a lot of coups, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they made the military either take an oath of loyalty to the Constitution Oof. or retire. Okay. But all this did was, I mean, make them mad, right? They're just like, yeah. fine, here's your oath. Yeah. But fuck you. I'm still mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
They introduce women's suffrage. That's good. Mm-hmm. Civil marriage, uh, divorce. Good. Yeah. They mandated the separation of church and state. That's very good. Yeah. No, these are these are kind of. I think this is more of the the major changes part. The anti-clerical mm-hmm. part actually did kind of go through. Okay. Guaranteed, for example, a free mandatory secular education That's instead of good. religious schools. Yes. Uh, they built around seven thousand co-ed secular schools. Wow. They're fighting, you know, illiteracy. They were around 50% illiterate at the Oof, point. Yeah. What uh, year is this again? That was the state take power in 1931. Yeah. Not a great stat for that time. <laughs> yeah. This, of course, pissed off the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were seen as, like we said, seen as allies of kind of the landowning class and the rich. I mean, because they also owned land and were rich. Like, yeah. <laughs> they kind of are that. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's why their <laughs> class interests kind of align. Yeah. Thinking about charity, too, and how they see themselves as that's our role to take care of people, but mm. they can only get this if they, you know, believe in X, Y, Z. I think yeah. that's kind of part of it, too, where, like, they feel like their power and their influence comes from, like, they're being poor people still. There's a, they kind of are gatekeepers in that way. I think right? so. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a very uncharitable oh. uh, reading on it, but. Yeah, that's, I don't know, that's, I, I don't believe that it would be like maybe con- maybe i'm being generous consciously yeah they're not motivating. throwing their mustaches being like i'm gonna keep everyone poor so i can keep having a church but it does benefit them mm-hmm. to make themselves look good by feeding the poor or whatever it is yeah so i we'll don't see that so yeah as kind of allies of landowners and everything and we mentioned the anti-clerical mm-hmm. streak that was there when the republic takes power there is also kind of a, a outbreak of anti-clerical violence Ooh, okay all right so they these priests well they start burning down convents and as one does killing people okay uh the cops kind of stand back and let it happen Oof. okay uh, the minister of war at the time and then later on prime minister says quote all the churches in spain are not worth one republican life wow in terms of like why were they not going into yeah anything? they're like let it fucking burn i'm i'm good out here yeah so this was said that was like pre- maybe their like biggest punch was yeah against the church happen. Yeah. yeah land reform very mm. moderate and very slow about land reform okay the right still thought that it was insane you yeah know? that's like their least favorite word yeah i mean you hear that <laughs> and it's coup time you know oh yeah uh, but it wasn't nearly enough for the peasants they were like barely getting anything from the government. A lot of them started doing land reform on their own. Nice. <laughs> Just Love started it. occupying and expropriating <laughs> land from large landowners. Oh, that's the dream. It was, I mean, it was a desperate situation. They, uh, 70% of the land was owned by 2% of the people. Jesus Christ. So they needed something and they yeah. started doing it, you know, and that's in the more rural areas and stuff, of course. Yeah, yeah, where they can kind of get away with it. Yeah. They passed some pro-union laws, kind of improved working conditions somewhat. They had cool. like an eight-hour day. Great. <laughs> uh, and they had the support of the UGT labor union, the okay. socialist one. Yeah. They did not have the support of the CNT. They were like, this is a state you this guys suck. This is bullshit, yeah. yeah. They also allowed for home rule for regions like Catalonia. Oh, okay. Because that's like a big deal. Yeah. Now, Catalonia. Kind of, right? It's there's still this like autonomy mm-hmm. movement there and independence movement um, for some people there as well. And that's that had been kind of a long brewing issue. Yeah. Catalonia at the time was more prosperous and more industrialized than the rest of Spain. And they, you know, wanted more autonomy and just kind of do their own thing. Yeah. Uh, the CNT kind of had most of its roots, its origins were there. Its main power base was there. They like were kind of more tied to, I guess, Catalonia. They were, again, not cooperating with the Republic at all. Mm-hmm. They, you know, someone asked them about, like, what their stance on the whole thing was, and they said, we remain in open war with the state. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck this. You yeah. Know? It reminded me kind of of the Bolsheviks and the provisional government. And yeah, so they're, they're like, like nope. fuck that, that's not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government of this, of the Second Republic, they put down a couple of coups slash insurrections. You had a military coup attempt in 1932 called the San Jorjada. Uh, you also had an anarchist uprising in Andalusia in 1933 that they uh, they stomped on. So both of those events lose the government support from the left and the right. Yeah, yeah, everyone's yeah. mad. Right, yeah. And they still have an economic crisis going on. And so then after two years of their governance, an election comes up, 1933. Okay where they have made everyone upset. How does that go? 
Well, it's a mess. The right wing <laughs> parties managed to form what's called the Union of the Right. Okay. Which is never good. Sounds like I hate this union. <laughs> the one union, bes- I mean, the second union besides cop unions. Oh, yeah. yeah that yeah. I don't like. Its biggest player in the Union of the Right was called the Theta, uh, the CEDA, mm-hmm. the Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Rights. Okay. This was a Catholic conservative party. <laughs> Yeah, the name though doesn't sound like it's bad. It's like it's like the American Center for Progress or something. You're like, yeah, I want people to have autonomous rights. Right, the ACLU or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, but no, they're a Catholic conservative party. They see themselves as def- defending Spain and Christian civilization, which Oof. to them would be like religion, family, and property. Okay. Defending against the you know the evils of Marxism. Wow. Okay. They were, I mean, proto-fascist. Yeah. They get a little bit more fascist as time kind of goes on. Okay, okay. Uh, but they're not really fascists. They were actual fascists in the alliance. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Falange Española. Okay. It was founded by the dictator's kid. So that guy from before, Primo de Rivera. Oh, yeah, yeah. His kid, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera. It was an actual fascist party. It was in the coalition. It was tiny. Mm-hmm. Barely anybody voted for it. It kind of sucked. It was so bad that like it ends up merging with some other ones to become the F.E. de las Hons, okay. which is has a long, complicated name. It'll come <laughs> into play later, though. So they like evolve, but they're fascists, okay. the actual ones. The Theta, they're just kind of close. Yeah, yeah, they're not they're great. Conservative, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, you have a united right. Great. You have a divided left. Oh, no. We uh, always do this. Right, yeah. So at the time, the Communist Party, the PCE, the Communist Party of Spain, mm-hmm. insignificantly small. It's like oh. barely anybody there. Damn it. Uh, and the PSOE, who we mentioned before, the Socialists. Yes. They were really the only major left party participating. Okay. Because, I mean, we mentioned the anarchists. Yeah, they're, they're not probably not playing. No. They thought the election was bullshit. <laughs> yeah. They said, don't vote. As anarchists do. They said, if, if, the, if the right wing wins, we're going to overthrow the government. So no don't vote. Deal. <laughs> Just stay home. Get ready. Go buy a gun instead. Basically, yes. They were, that's what they, that was their strategy. <laughs> wow. And so the right wing won. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, the one time you could actually blame like the left for staying home. Yeah, I mean, it's not guaranteed that they would have won, but <laughs> it was not good. Uh, yeah. The Theta won the most seats, followed by the centrist radical party. Sorry, what? Cent- Radically centrist? <laughs> they were just, they were called, originally called the Radical Republican Party, I think, okay. but they were just... They were just centrists. They were centrists. They just, um, they just wanted, they were early adopters of the use of radical as a term for cool, like in the 80s. <laughs> Rad, <laughs> They're just, they love to surf. <laughs> Um, and then the socialists were a distant third. Mm-hmm. Uh, the right wing was in the driver's seat. Damn it! With actually the radical party in in the Pastor. real like prime minister <laughs> mm, okay. seat because they thought, oh, we don't want to piss everyone off with the theta because they're kind of oof. So. Mm, okay. Then you have what's called the black biennium. Okay, black biennium. Biennium, yeah. Okay, so, so that like one, two- that time period was called the first biennium, which is like just a period of two years. Okay, that's what I was going to ask if that was like a. A year thing. Yeah, and then this one's called the Black Biennium because it's bad. It's called that by the left. All my years are biennium years. <laughs> <laughs> From those elections, uh-huh. you know, they take power in the next set of years. The right start doing shitty things. They stop land reform. They start kicking out the few workers that had gotten land from the government. They start kicking them out. Uh, they stop the military reforms. They make sure that, like, the top generals hate the republic. They restore the old position of dominance of the Catholic Church. Oh, gosh. And uh, just like they promised, the anarchists say this is bullshit. Yeah. And so when that Theta group, when they finally get officially into the government, Uh they're like, that's a step too far. Those guys are fascists. Fuck that. They're going to turn everything fascist. So they revolted. They started started a general strike. Nice. In Asturias. I love a strike. Up in the north. Uh, And on October 4th, they launched this. It blossoms into the wider revolution of 1934, which is really disorganized in most okay. of Spain. It doesn't It doesn't really work. Okay. Uh, and it's quickly crushed everywhere but Asturias, where mm. the left actually was united in mm. this rebellion. I mean, you had, right, the, the CNT, you know, the anarcho-syndicalist unions. But you also had the socialists. You had nice. the UGT and the, and the Socialist Party. You had uh, the communists united in it to everybody. And 
they, you know, they did this general strike. They formed revolutionary committees. They declared a proletarian revolution. They abolished regular money. They executed some enemies, and they got ready to defend themselves from what the state was going to do. Wow! Wow! Uh, so the government brought in the cops, and the <laughs> army of Africa, the foreign legion, Moroccan colonial troops. Holy shit! And they uh, crushed it in a couple. They brought of weeks. everyone home from their crumbling empire. Like, oh shit, we yeah. gotta crush this at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they stomped it down. They killed seventeen hundred people. Okay. They captured tens of thousands more. It was led by a real asshole, a guy we'll be talking a lot about, General Francisco Franco. I've heard of this motherfucker. Yeah, he's a piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, he was, at the time, though, working for the Republic because that mm -hmm. was still around and, you know, so he was he was crushing, uh, crushing rebellions on their behalf. Jeez. Only later to become the rebel himself. <laughs> In the February 1936... Election that came, you know, just around the corner. Yes. The left had kind of learned its lesson. We're like, oh, we got to show up. Well, we got to show up and we got to show up together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, instead of being divided, it united into something called the Popular Front. Yes, love it. <laughs> Good name. Uh, it included the communists. It included a new separate communist party called the PUM, the P-O-U-M. Okay. The Workers' Party of Marxist Unification. That's they a were cool name. they were a uh, they were a communist party, but they were like anti-Stalinist, so they were like yeah. Basically, it means they weren't aligned with the common term. Is how okay. you want to phrase that. That's fine. Um, yeah, you know, probably a good call to well, not be aligned with Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that is yeah. That's what we would say. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's an official take. Uh, let's see who else is in this. The socialists, mm -hmm. the PSOE. They were now way less moderate. Like okay. they had more of a left-wing faction that was pushing them in that direction. Nice. And you also had some kind of left liberal Republican parties in there. Okay. Crucially, it had not only the support of the Catalan and the Galician nationalist parties. Mm -hmm. uh, so just they weren't really socialist or left really or anything. They just like wanted they more wanted, autonomy. Yeah. It also had the support of the socialist UGT trade union mm -hmm. and also the support of the CNT. Of the So everybody's Americas. in this party. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I wish this was a thing. <laughs> Imagine if we all got off Twitter and Reddit, touched some grass, and hung out with each other and got shit done. It would be <laughs> wild. <laughs> oh, I sound like old man yells at clouds. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're. That's a very good. I mean, that's one of the lessons of this. Is yeah. The dangers of left disunity and the mm -hmm. possibilities of left unity. Yeah, and and that's it's a frustrating thing. Like I've seen it in our own. Like in our own like small podcast community here, like people be like, oh, like you you weren't this enough, you weren't this enough, and I'm just like, I mean, I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> like I I'm I'm pretty open. We're cafeteria leftists here, yeah. which has its faults too. But like mm -hmm. at this point where it's so scattered, I think you kind of have to take it. Like um, yeah. so this is a weird analogy maybe, but I was talking to this gay couple in my neighborhood. She was telling me about this book where someone went across the country to different uh, towns. They started in like big cities. They started in like New York, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. There was another one. And they went to like the gay neighborhoods there. Okay. And then they started like traveling across like small town America or whatever, like Alabama, whatever. And they found that the gay communities in those smaller towns were more inclusive. And it's because it's like, well, there's not fucking many of us. So like, we don't <laughs> care. <laughs> like, yeah, come okay. in. Because like, if you think about like a stereotypical gay neighborhood, like in a big city, like in Dallas, like uptown is very white, very male, very like gay culture uh -huh. in that way. But it leaves out a lot of other part of the, like the LGBTQ plus spectrum, you know, like it's often said like, LGBT, like the T gets left behind a lot, like mm. in legislation and stuff. Okay. But when you have like these smaller communities, it's like we gotta fucking take everyone that comes in here. I don't care what yeah. you are. Okay, that makes sense. It's a broader fight because of the situation. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was the idea with the popular front too. You're like faced with fascism. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't fucking care if like what book you like. We gotta fight fascism. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So the so the CNT was involved. Mm -hmm. They're not running candidates or anything. They don't believe in that. But yeah. they tell people, go vote. Mm -hmm. At the very least, if, you, you know, if you're still sitting there saying, fuck this, fuck the state. Go vote and sure. then go buy a gun. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's... Because they, they were saying, like, <laughs> get these guys in power. 
Because at the very least, they're going to set our prisoners free when they get in there. Mm, nice. All right? Okay. So do that. And then, yeah, we'll, then we'll do some revolution. <laughs> we can still plan for revolution <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, and so the showdown in the election is a close one in the popular vote, but not in terms of seats. The popular front wins a majority of seats, so they take the reins of government. Okay. So we win. Nice. They immediately freed people from the prisons, and they started the reforms up again. Meanwhile, strikes and land expropriations broke out. And the right by this point was like, this fucking sucks, you know? Mm. We lost this election. A lot of them start going over to the Falange party, the, the, the fascists. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. The phalangists, you also the, the call them. The small one, right? That was the small yes, one. Yeah. yeah. Because they're like, these guys have been kind of anti-parliamentarian the whole time. Mm. They're real radicals, you know? Okay. So that's why they go to them. That party gets banned, and you start to see fighting between leftists and rightists raging in the streets throughout Spain. Ooh, Street okay. Fights. The right wing and the military, of course, they were like, this is fine. More reforms, right? This is okay. Mm -hmm. I guess we just have to, you know, rule of law. It's okay. <laughs> For sure, yeah. <laughs> Everything ended up fine. Franco was like, ah, oh, that's fine. I'll just follow orders. And we Man. now have a socialist utopia in Spain, right? That's right. what happened? It Exactly wrong. Wait, yeah. this is a really short podcast this time. <laughs> 30 minutes, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> no, so um, instead they started to almost openly start talking about mm. taking some action. Okay. Some direct action. Getting the goods. Getting the goods, but fascists. But in a bad way. Getting yeah. the bads. Getting the bads. <laughs> uh, so the government, scared about this and hearing the generals start to do all this sort of stuff, mm. they sent that General Franco guy. He was like the youngest guy to become general. He had really quickly climbed through the ranks. Mm -hmm. So he was super popular. And they were like, this guy's dangerous. They sent it. They basically exiled him to Ooh, the Canary Islands. Okay. And he's kind of interesting. So he was Franco. He was born in 1892. Mm -hmm. He was a kid when Spain started losing its empire. And so he joins the army as a young man. Part of his new generation is being like steeped in this creepy legend of like or like mythology that like you guys are going to be the saviors of spain yeah like it's a focus on like who we were basically like mm -hmm. a reactionary kind of thing yeah yeah he sees himself as kind of this and his you know class as kind of these bulwarks against the encroachments of Marxism, mm -hmm. of international foreign influence. Mm. There's also this like anti Semitic angle to it where they're oh. like, there's just like Judeo Bolshevik uh, conspiracy oh. and stuff like that. Like, it's weird. They're I weird. know Spain kicked out Jews like back in the day. In 1492. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's a new verse to that rhyme. Yeah. Uh, they did that. Yeah. It was very, it was a. They have, they have a history of that shit, basically. Yeah. yeah. Ideologically, Franco was basically a monarchist, like a, mm -hmm. kind of a conservative, you know. He wanted to keep things the way they used to be, sort of in a way reactionary by this point. Yeah, yeah. Because they moved on. He wanted to put an end to the disorder, to the labor unrest, to the religious persecutions. Mm -hmm. Law and order, classic. He wanted to go of, back to an empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in June 1936, he gets drawn into a coup mm -hmm. being plotted by a guy named General Emilio Mola. Okay. And also some other plotters were General Jose Sanjurjo, who had led that previous like one that got crushed. Okay, yeah. And that's why it was called the Sanjurjada. And uh, General Manuel got it. Okay. And they were like, we're going to do a coup. All right, foreign bad guys club. <laughs> they put it on the calendar, July 18, we're doing a coup. <laughs> they all synced their, their Google calendars. <laughs> yeah, I set, set, you know, some of them set just one reminder, some of them set a few. Mm -hmm. but... <laughs> they hit snooze maybe once, like, hold on, I still need to put on my, my fancy general outfit. <laughs> yeah, so they plotted this coup. And it's interesting because you're like, what, what? I mean, you know, but Franco, he's not going to do very well with this coup. He's stuck in the Canary Islands. Yeah, how's right? that work? Well, uh, luckily for him, he just so happened to get a flight chartered mm. to take him from there to Morocco so that he could lead the army of Africa in a coup. Okay, how did this happen? How did that happen? Very interesting Was story. it the United States? It was not the United States, but our very close friends over in England. <laughs> oh man, those guys. This is a ridiculous scheme, okay. but it is true. There was a wealthy Spaniard named Luis Bolin. Okay. And he met with an English magazine editor, this fascist named Douglas Francis Gerald. Okay. They just had lunch one day. <laughs> and over lunch, they planned the whole thing. They got former 
<laughs> British intelligence officer Hugh Pollard, which anybody in the intelligence community will be like, former. I, yeah, it wasn't official. It's, it's kind like, of sketchy. Okay. And, yeah, I don't know. If you're a listener, if you're retired, you know, former. If you're actually converted, somehow you found this show, please email us. Yeah. That's very interesting. <laughs> but my suspicion of former intelligence officers is always like, mm. Mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, Hugh Pollard, he got his friend Cecil Bibb to take them on a plane paid for by Boland, this very, like, I've heard him described as the richest man in Spain at the time. Mm, okay. He charted, you know, he paid for this plane for them to fly over. They got, like, a couple of girls to take with them to pretend they were tourists. Uh, and they flew to the Canary Islands. They picked up Franco, and they took him to Morocco. Holy shit. This is like if... I don't know, Steve Bannon or something, some right-wing journalist, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. plotted an escape. From, that's so insane. Like, that's insane. Yeah, it got him there basically on the 19th, basically in time mm -hmm. to take part in the coup instead of, like, waiting months later, yeah. you know. I've read some suspicions that actual British intelligence was, like, helping. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure. There's no proof. But, okay. But we'll, we'll find a few of those not-proof situations <laughs> happening. Meanwhile, back in Madrid, rival assassinations are rocking the capital. Mm -hmm. uh, you had Jose Castillo, who was kind of a rare fellow, a rare specimen, a socialist cop. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, he got assassinated by this right-wing ambush. Wow. And so some of the cops and some of his friends arrested a guy named Jose Calvo Sotelo, mm -hmm. one of the leaders of one of the right-wing parties. And he just took him out and assassinated him. Oh, shit. In reprisal. And so fighting breaks out at their dueling funerals yeah. and it kind of like galvanizes both sides for what's to come. They're like, yeah, fuck, fuck you, this. you did this. Yeah. yeah. The government really wasn't responding to the threat of a coup. They're like, what? We exiled that guy. It'll be fine. <laughs> It'll be fine. Don't worry. The left, like the socialists, the anarchists, they were just like, please, like give the people weapons so mm -hmm. we can defend against this when the army inevitably rises up what's about to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're like, nah, dude, we don't, we don't, we don't need to do that. That's that's chaos. You guys are fighting in the streets. You can't handle it. You're not responsible enough. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So they launched the coup. <laughs> the government belatedly is like, oh, fuck. Oh, here you go, workers. You know? um, and so this begins the Civil War. Wow. So, yeah, I, I think the hesitance to arm the people, I mean, obviously that's fucked up. And then... Mm -hmm. Very obvious how a coup would be able to go off when you have a structure like the military where, like, that is kind of just fascism boiled down into an organization. It's like yeah. they're all about that hierarchy and knowing mm -hmm. your place, law and order. Discipline, and especially mm -hmm. these guys who have, you know, they're they're like imperialist too. You know, exactly. Like, that is their job is they, to enforce that. And they see themselves as somewhat apart from the government, even though they yes. need to, you know, say the loyalty thing, like, it doesn't matter. They, they think they're different. Yeah, because they're the ones out in the front lines or whatever. Yeah, the, you know, the true defenders of the empire. I don't know. It seems obvious. And maybe, it, I mean, obviously it was to some people. <laughs> yeah, they like, were like, uh, we can tell, you know? Yeah. The government just didn't want to, and maybe couldn't deal with it. Yeah, yeah. The Civil War began really because the coup only half succeeded. Okay. I mean, the yeah. coup is supposed to take over the government. Yeah, otherwise there would not be a civil war, probably. <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, it's only half successful. The Republic held most of Spain, mm -hmm. if only for now. The north and the east of the country, especially. Uh, Madrid, Valencia, Barcelona, Cartagena, Bilbao, and Mal Malaga. Mm -hmm. the nationalists took the area of north of Madrid and the southwest. So Seville... Okay. Pamplona, Burgos, uh, Valladolid, Salamanca, and Zaragoza. So that's how things start. And because they don't take everything over, I mean, now you have a civil war. you got two sides, the nationalists and the republicans. Okay. So the nationalists, that's the right-wing side. Yes. That's General Franco mm -hmm. and his team. They're led initially by several generals, but thanks to one guy getting executed, he was trying to do the rebellion in Barcelona. He gets mm, captured yeah, yeah. and executed. And the other two having very convenient plane crashes. <laughs> okay. That have never been proven to be connected to Franco, but that left Franco completely in charge mm, with the national side. Okay. <laughs> he was, you know, eventually just the sole leader there. Yeah. They kind of had an amalgam of monarchists, fascists, and just conservatives. Anyone who you can think of that was an asshole. Yeah, basically. Was in that category. Ugh. 
the nationalists, those were the rebels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Republicans were the left-wing side, the government. Uh, they were obviously led by the Spanish Republic. Their leadership changes so often is not too crucial to go into. Yeah. Interestingly, they also kind of had a fluctuating relationship with the anarchist CNT. So sometimes okay. this, the CNT was like keeping them at arm's length. Sometimes they were actually in the government. Mm. And sometimes eventually they'll be persecuted by the government. Jesus, okay. So those are the two sides. In the early days of the war were some of the bloodiest in terms of the Red Terror and the White Terror. Okay, gosh. Right. These, this is where, you know, each side, so the Republicans doing the Red Terror. Okay. And the Nationalists doing the White Terror. Yeah, I mean, Nationalists love White Terror, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and this is exact, exactly the same naming convention you see in the, like, the Russian Civil mm -hmm. War, for example. The Red and the White. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this is where they did some violence. They murdered their opponents. Okay. Estimates kind of vary about the death toll. It depends on how you count, who you ask, all these things. Leftists ended up killing anywhere from around 38 to 72,000 okay. people. And nationalists end up killing around 160 to 200,000. Oof, okay, okay. It's brutal on both sides. Both sides see it as necessary. One difference I would kind of point out is that the nationalists essentially kind of they, they, they coldly, methodically kind of plan and carry out a campaign of terror. Yeah, yeah. They are saying we're doing this to instill, to restore order in places that they were taking over. Mm -hmm. They dressed up a lot of their executions with show trials Ooh. that were 15 minutes long. Uh, and oh. just hauled them all in. Yeah, you know, run through the legal formalities, haul them off. Franco actually set a like a like a cap on those and said that you can only find a maximum of one out of five of the people to go through these trials. You can only acquit Whoa. one out of five. I want people going into those trials and coming out dead. Wow. Yeah. What the fuck? So they're you know I, I think that they they have a little more intentionality. Whereas on the red terror side, most of it was almost like mob violence, more mm -hmm. like people just kind of their angers. And it's not good, but you know their angers mm -hmm. like. And a lot of times justified boiling over and taking vengeance. So when you say mob violence, do you mean they're like, it's not who, like are they, who are they killing? Large landowners, uh, okay. clergymen, people who were known to have been supporting the previous nationalist regime. Okay, okay. Uh, any, you know, opponents. Anyone yeah, who yeah. was raising their head and, and saying something about it. Yeah. Uh, that's bad in a way, but I think it was like unsanctioned. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't methodical in a way... Were the other ones like the fascists? I'm maybe I'm like picturing this wrong, but I, you were saying that Spain is like at the time was a little bit rural. Were they just like going around to like people's houses and shit too, or were they just like was this more city based or I don't know? So it was both. You, you had a lot of times rely on like the local groups there. So when mm -hmm. you rolled in town, whichever side you were on, Republican or nationalist, you probably had some sympathizers in that town. Yeah. And so if you were now in charge, those guys were like, a lot of times you just arrest anybody who was suspected of being on the other side. Yeah. And then the local people would go back and pick through and say, this guy, this guy. This, this guy, guy sucks. This guy's yeah. cool. Interesting. Okay. That's, I mean, that's fucked up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Either way, it's hell on earth. Yeah. Like you for said, sure. fucked up. Steady execution. So steady in some places that... The uh, more entrepreneurial sorts set up uh, snack bars in the public squares to watch Whoa. the executions. So, yeah. Wow. Got to have quite the stomach for that. Yeah. Let's not leave anyone else out, though. Let's get everybody involved. Some international involvement here. Okay. Who's on our teams? <laughs> well, first, who's not on our teams? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> 27 nations signed on to a non-intervention agreement in 1936. Okay. They said, we're not going to aid either side in mm. the Civil War, right? This included an economic embargo, and it was organized by Britain and France. Okay. Okay. Some other signatories to this were the Soviet Union. Italy and Germany. Okay. Uh, why didn't the Soviet Union help out? That's usually their thing. Well, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> this is just them agreeing not to. Okay, okay. The United States didn't sign on, but independently had a policy of non-intervention. Yeah. I think here that non-intervention ends up being kind of tacit support for the nationalists. Mm-hmm. Because they're better supplied. Oh. Like, they have more shit. They have, like, a better equipped army because they, they mostly were came from the army. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they... 
you know, also were secretly getting support from people. So like, if you actually complied with this, mm -hmm. you were getting duped. Yeah. Like, because, okay, some signatories to that. For example, the organizers of it, Britain, they let Franco build a base in Gibraltar, one of their colonies. <laughs> Great. They let the Germans fly planes over it. They ratted out Republican shipping routes to the nationalists. What the fuck? They're, you know, yeah, they were, the creators they were of helping. This. Yeah. All right, France. France actually did try to do non-intervention because they were scared that, like, they would have, you know, internal strife of their own because yeah, I mean, of their domestic right, They're politics. right fucking there, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Their air minister, however, kind of sympathetic to the Republican side, ended up secretly selling warplanes to them. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, people were cheating. Yes. The, the U.S., <laughs> for example, ours was very informal. Uh, they, we banned arm sales to both sides, mm -hmm. but businesses could still supply other things. Ford and GM, for example, sold 12,000 trucks to the Nationalists. Oof, okay. And the Nationalists spent a million dollars a month on tires, cars, and machine tools from the USA. Oh, wow. Okay. And Texaco, all right, the <laughs> Texas oil company back then, mm -hmm. uh, broke their supply contract with the Republicans. They had already signed this contract, and they turned that tanker over and went to the Nationalist port oh. and, and didn't sell it to them, lent it to them on credit what because the, the Nationalists fuck? didn't have any money for it. What the fuck, Texaco? I mean, I already knew you were bad, but that's, <laughs> a, that's just outwardly mask off bad. Don't worry. They got a fine of like a few tens of thousands of dollars and they, <laughs> they learned their lesson right no well they they continued the whole thing till the end of the war <laughs> so <laughs> oh my god so that's non-intervention for you yeah didn't work out some other members of our crew here for the nationalists obviously the fascists are going to be supporting them right so they yeah. had support from Mussolini's Italy mm -hmm. another signatory to the to the non-intervention uh, <laughs> uh, but instead they sent 50,000 troops they sent wow. guns tanks planes artillery uh, Hitler's Germany mm -hmm. also said, we're not going to intervene, but they but directly they totally did. did. Yeah. It's, for example, Nazi planes that took Franco's army of Africa from, you know, where he had done the coup, mm -hmm. took them to mainland Spain wow. to spread the rebellion in the early days. So they were really crucial. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for there. sure. Nazi planes that teamed up with Italian ones to bomb the city of Guernica Fuck. in 1937, killed hundreds of people there. Yeah. German soldiers trained some 50,000 nationalist soldiers by the end of the war. They sent around 16,000 troops and also sent tanks. A dear friend of the show, the Vatican, was also a <laughs> fan of this. Wow. Yeah, they, obviously, you know, so surprised they didn't send any troops. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's been a Secret while since... Jesus troops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they had they had the Knights of the Templar just on standby <laughs> this whole Show time. Show up in, like, medieval armor. Uh, <laughs> But no, 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 they were they were totally cool with their bishops, like writing a letter to Catholics worldwide, mm -hmm. defending the conflict as a crusade against the godless communists. Oh my God! But okay, Catholic Church. If you look up one day and you're on the same side as the Nazis, <laughs> maybe not a good look. Uh, yeah, well, that's you know one Jesus. of the things about rat lines and stuff in World War II. There's a Vatican connection there. Ooh. Uh, they were also one of the first countries to recognize the nationalists uh, as, like, the government there. Wow. And they, they also had help from Portugal, which was also kind of a quasi-fascist uh, mm, yeah. country. So right next door, friendly port. Mm -hmm. Good for them. For the Republicans, all right. Who was uh, their friends? For the Republicans, they had something called... One big group that they had was the International Brigades. Okay. All right. The... Fascists, the nationalists, kind of had their own like smattering of volunteers. Yeah. But the international brigades was much larger. This was for the Republican side. Yeah. All right. And this was organized by the Common Turn, the Communist International. Oh, okay. Here we go. It's in September 36, so a few months into the war. They are drawn from all over. There's around 59,000 of them. There's also like 3,000 or so fighting in other militias there, mm -hmm. not in the international brigades. Okay. So. George Orwell is an example of those guys. Yeah. He fought with a militia in, with the PUM, the independent Marxist party there. Interesting. Uh, the CNT also had international volunteers. There was also an anarchist column called the Duruti column. Okay. And also took international volunteers. But yeah, the international brigades are kind of cool. I, I picked a few of like well-known yeah. uh, battalions to talk about. Uh, we, and from the United States, you had the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. Okay. Weird name yeah. for that, but sure. Well, we had a few, actually. So the Abraham Lincoln Battalion is the best-known one. We also had the George Washington Battalion and the John Brown Battery. Ooh, I want to be in the John Brown one. That one sounds cool. <laughs> the interesting thing about these guys is later on, 
they are they were discouraged initially mm -hmm. you know and they even threatened that they would pull citizenship from people who went but wow. they didn't okay but they these guys a lot of these guys did face blacklist stuff when mm -hmm. the red scare happened later mm, that makes sense for being you know prematurely <laughs> <laughs> you are a really early adopter huh yeah prematurely anti-fascist don't do yeah. that <laughs> uh from ireland you had the Connolly column nice love that guy they're named after our friend james Connolly. yes and uh, from Germany, you had the Talman Battalion, named after German communist leader Ernst Talman, okay. who was he was like the leader of their communist party. He had been so this is you know time of Hitler's Germany. Yeah. he had been thrown in a concentration camp. Oh shit! Point. Okay, he ends up dying in a concentration camp later in World War Two. You know, one of the things about their battalion is they were super hardcore. They didn't have a country to go back to. Yeah, America. yeah. So they were like already exiled. Fuck. Yeah, from Italy, you had the Garibaldi Battalion. They were basically the the, the non asshole Italians. You know, the ones <laughs> yeah, that were... like let's get the fuck out of here. This sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and from France and Belgium, you had the Louise Michel Battalions, named after the Red Virgin of Montmartre, Louise Michel from the Paris Commune. Oh, hey. So uh, you know, these guys were from all over. Mexico also helped the Republicans. Oh, nice. They sent around two million dollars in aid, rifles, food, and a few aircraft. John Mexico. Yeah, yeah. But the major ally for the Republicans was the Soviet Union. Yes, okay. I was wondering if they are going to show up. Yep, yeah, here they are. They did take payment for their services. <laughs> uh, and they took around $750 million of the Spanish gold reserves. Ooh, They just okay. put those on trains, took them out, I guess, to the docks, and then sent them over. And they couldn't have had that much left because, like we said, they like owed a bunch of money to people. So they still Oof. had the gold reserves. Yeah, they had that though. <laughs> so they took that. Great. But they sent it. I mean, you know, they did that, and people say it's kind of an asshole move. Yeah, a little bit. Maybe it is. But I they mean, also they like... paid them back with like you know, way longer of survival. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is pretty much attributable to them at that point. Yeah. Uh, okay. What year was this? This is in 1936, when everything So they were probably out. struggling, too, you know? Oh, yeah, they weren't. <laughs> By that point, I guess Stalin had been in power for a little bit. I don't remember precisely. But they had been, you know, started industrializing and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, yeah, they're not, like, sitting on tons and tons of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union sent in 2,000 troops, like, kind of as... You know, they, they fought, and they were pilots and, and tank operators mm -hmm. and trainers as well wow. uh, they sent tons of planes and tanks and artillery and trucks and guns and ammo they also sent some very polite and kind nkvd secret police officers okay mm they were not very polite or kind yeah what do those guys do <laughs> uh they were kind of enforcing the moscow line there so mm. just making sure that no one did anything you know to plot with the fascists whether real or imagined interesting that's yeah. not great no, they, they end up being pretty bad. Okay, don't like that. But other than that, I mean, like I said, their aid is really why this isn't over in 1936. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. All right, so those are that's kind of the international scene. Got the two sides, mm -hmm. got their supporters. Then what happens? Alongside this, in the opening months of the Civil War, the government the middle class kind of liberal mm -hmm. government was kind of paralyzed basically it okay. was just like what right <laughs> they just hid under their desks like oh yeah, no essentially <laughs> it happens a little bit differently you know in terms of regions in catalonia aragon andalusia valencia being the center of it mm -hmm. but essentially the common people throughout throughout those regions mm -hmm. through the cnt and the UGT, those labor unions, they take power for themselves. Ooh. Right, it's called the Spanish Revolution of 1936. Okay. Wait, so we're still in the Civil War mm -hmm. and then there's also a revolution? Okay. Yeah. Messy. So this is more of like a social revolution. Happening, yeah, yeah. Right? They're like, fuck, the government didn't do anything. There's massacres. Let me do something. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so they take power for themselves. It's a workers' commune, a dictatorship of the proletariat, if Ooh, you will. Oh, delicious. At this point, they're like the only real defense against the nationalists. Yeah. And this is the opening months. The international brigades don't show up till September, so a little while later. Okay. Right. And that aid from other countries is still kind of like starting to come in. So this is really all they have. Yeah. In general, people arm themselves. The CNT and the UGT did a general strike. Mm-hmm. People took to the streets, you know, anarcho syndicalist style. Yeah. And they uh, took weapons from the state weapons depots. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, 
set about controlling their own society. They organized militias to go out to the front to defend their territory. They started collectivizing agriculture wow. and industry. They, yeah, they implemented libertarian socialism pretty damn, much all just over the place. Doing the damn thing. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. It's radical. They take over factories and hotels and stores and farms, whatever. Bosses start fleeing to France. <laughs> Some of them don't make it. The particularly bad ones, I imagine, they end up getting murdered. Whoops. Uh, they change workplace conditions. They run them more safely, more efficiently. Like, productivity goes up by, like, 50%. Whoa. Um, Take that, capitalists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what bosses that were still there, right, mm -hmm. the bosses that remained, took orders from workers' committees. Mm. So they were no longer so much the boss. It's Hell just like yeah. The just manager. kind of a manager. Yeah. 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 And uh, they also, you know, created pension systems and stuff cool. for their employment. So, yeah, radical changes going on. The unions supplied food wherever it was needed. They were also bartering or using time vouchers mm. issued by local committees. We love a time voucher around here. <laughs> yeah, I like I, I imagine, who was it, Josiah Warren or somebody yeah, yeah. would be proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> they exchanged goods for food with the villages nearby. So the cities would, you know, trade with the villages for food. Cool. Um, they repurposed these fancy glittering hotels as free hospitals. Fuck yes. Uh, there was free health care. They also used, like, the bottom floors of them for cheap, popular cafeterias. Nice. Uh, instead of, you know, the fancy hotel mm -hmm. restaurants and all that. Oh, um, this sounds good. I mean, besides the whole death part, this uh, sounds good. Death, yeah. <laughs> the rest of it I love. This They opened up and they demolished a lot of prisons. Wow. Just were like, fuck that. We're not doing that anymore. Fuck yes. So, yeah, they're really doing it. They also looted and burned some <laughs> churches. Also executed some opponents. Okay, okay. Room for improvement, but you know, you probably had to do that shit. That's what they would say. Also, at, at this point, the government was like, oh my god, these guys are, uh, holy shit, uh, do you guys want like a seat in the government? Like, please, like, <laughs> Can you please stop burning yes, things you know, and essentially. like, come do this like as a job instead? They just gave him the finger. They were like, no. No, we're doing uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got this. So, yeah, and you know, people look back and say, oh, well, you know, what could they have done if they had taken power? It's, it's kind of a question, I guess, on hmm. the anarchist left is, yeah. was that a mistake? I don't know. I don't know if at that point it really was. I don't know. Because at that point they were just kind of scrambling to survive that, like, I worry if they gotten into a power, it would have become much more bureaucratic in a way that maybe wouldn't have been helpful. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, Because on the other side, no it could be, idea. it could be lead to a more unified resistance against. That's true. Yeah, that, it, could have, so. it could have gotten more organized. We'll talk a little bit more about that okay. as time goes on. In terms of this social revolution, there was a major role for women. Tell me about these cool ladies. Well, Spain, you know, incredibly patriarchal before that. Mm -hmm. uh, lower pay, worse literacy, which was already bad, but worse than that. I mean, do um, we need to point out the connection with that in the church? You know, <laughs> well, I apparently did. <laughs> confined to the domestic sphere, and there was, yeah, this religious dominance. Yep. So, yeah. Major improvements in the Spanish Revolution were made in terms of liberating women. Oh, yeah. And this was not just like, gee, we should fix things for women. They have it bad. This was achieved by women themselves. Fuck yes. Especially by members of the CNT who formed a group called Mujeres Libres. Nice. Free women. Yeah. I want a shirt of that. <laughs> Mujeres Libres? That'd yeah, be cool. that'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> this was founded by Lucia Sanchez San Saurnil, Amparo Poch y Gascon, and Mercedes Comaposada. Okay. It was in April 1936, and they advocated for ending the triple enslavement of mm. women to illiteracy, capital, and men. Oh, Yes. Isn't that cool? I want that as a sign outside my house. That's an awesome slogan. <laughs> yeah. So they helped to legalize abortion on demand. Mm, delicious. Organized women's militia training for the front. This is kind of a problem for the anarchists and the left more broadly. At the time, I guess they were coming from a very patriarchal society. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the men were kind of like, what the fuck? Get out of here, you know, or just like making fun of them when they were oh. on the train. So they're like, we're doing our own fucking training then. Yeah, know? yeah. And Interesting. They encourage women to enter the workforce mm -hmm. to keep this whole thing going. Yeah. The anarchist regions generally uh, were opposed to marriage as a thing. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I was watching this documentary that was talking about it, and they were saying, like, 
you know, people were coming to the unions and saying like, you know, my daughter, she's like living with this, with this guy, but they're not like married. And they're just like, well, this is, you know, we're revolutionaries. This is what we do. Yeah. Uh, but they were like, well, we don't want to piss everybody off. So they invented something called revolutionary weddings. Revolu I want one of those, man. Well, it was just, you would just show up, right? And you go to the, like the, the union, you yeah. know, and they would, they would just officiate basically. <laughs> Union officiated wedding. That's hilarious. And it was so the way they do that, they give you, you know, they have you fill out a little form mm -hmm. in triplicate. And just have you do a little, a little carbon copy, right? Yeah. And you fill it out and they're like, okay, so the union will keep this one. And mm -hmm. then you each keep this one. Bring these two back to us if you guys ever, you know, don't want to be married anymore. We'll wow. take you the third one and we'll burn them and That's you'll be divorced. Hilarious. So they like just, you know, legalize the divorce there. Yeah. Real, pretty easily. They kind of like informally discouraged it mm -hmm. the guy said basically like, like the cultural. union guy would kind of bring the guy over and be like i don't want you to take this lightly don't come <laughs> up come to me with just some you know yeah, nonsense stuff yeah they'll recommend counseling first or yeah whatever. <laughs> i guess yeah now that's a good red red wedding <laughs> <laughs> now this um is not permanent yeah mm, eventually the republic uh, once it kind of reasserts more control it's trying to kind of show that it's reasonable mm -hmm. and show that it's kind of deserving of international help. Okay. So they end up banning women from serving on the front and trying oh, to kind fuck. of pull back the reins. We're not so crazy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you know, the international community then comes galloping to their aid. That's an insane requirement. <laughs> like, I'm... No, it does, it does not, though. They, they don't even do that. Like, they... Oh, okay. They don't. Actually. Yeah. Okay, the Republic. Okay. Yeah. The Republic does these things. Please come help us. But yeah. No, no help. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an insane requirement. I agree. It's just that it didn't, it even, didn't work. even work. Oh my God. So yeah. there's no point to it. You just lost a lot of like cool soldiers basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So from there, the war continues and that's kind of going on alongside the war, but I just mm -hmm. kind of wanted a sidebar for the revolution part. Mm -hmm. By September, 1936, the nationalists had gained a lot of ground okay. and they were still on the move. Tons of advancement for the nationalists. The Republican government is in shambles mm. by this point, and they appoint socialist Francisco Largo Caballero okay. as their prime minister. And so when he takes power, he brings the communists into the government, Ooh. so the communist party. Okay, because like earlier the anarchists said no, so like let's try yeah. the communists. Right, the anarchists are still out. <laughs> he enters in here. He had kind of like been standoffish before, and had, you know, had been elected to parliament, but was not in the government. Okay. Know? The reason he br he's bringing the communists in, tiny party before, but their influence had been growing mm -hmm. because of the aid from the Soviet Union. Yeah. Kind of went hand in hand. This yeah. This common turn back party, obviously they're going to get more, get more of a say. Yes. So one of the Republic's goals by now was to get a grip, to reassert itself. <laughs> To stop fucking up so bad. Yeah, right? stop hiding under their desks. <laughs> yeah. Finally, by now, they have the International Brigade showing up, but still, like, by this, I mean, by November, their government had already fled to Valencia. So yeah. So, like, it was... Uh, Not great. Yeah. One of the things that they thought they should do in that regard was to postpone the rest of the social revolution until mm. the war was over. No, I hate when we do this. They said it's more important to fight the fascists than to do social revolution that might antagonize the middle classes. We don't want them going over to Franco. I mean, was that a problem? It could. I mean, I don't know how much of a problem it was. You could see how, like, you might have more people trying to do collaboration sort of stuff that mm -hmm. way. Or be less supportive of your movement. But on the other hand, I mean, the middle classes are not as numerous. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like you, in, you're you giving up. By saying yes to them, you're saying no to like peasants who are seeing a better life and then are more likely to want to fight for you because they're like, fuck yeah, I'm defending this cool new life I have. Yeah, that's yeah, that's my thinking. Bad right? strategy. Well, you and the anarchists and the POM, the P-O-U-M, mm -hmm. the socialists, uh, the Marxists, I guess, disagreed with this with their strategy, right? Yep, yep. You said social revolution and the fight against fascism was the same thing. Yeah, for sure. That was their argument. But the government cuts off mm. aid to the CNT and to the POOM. They, they cut off aid and say, you guys are, you know, being bastards, basically. Don't, you know, you're not getting anything from us. Fuck. You're not cooperating. Okay. 
So in November, it takes only like a month of that. The CNT says, okay, fine, we do need weapons. We're going to agree to join the government. Mm. So some of their leaders go join the government. This is very controversial. Yeah, I'm sure. For the anarchists, right? They're like... That's usually not their thing. That's a state, dude. You just joined a state. <laughs> yeah. In their defense, it was one of the few ways that they could... Keep going. Get guns. Get yeah. supplies. Yeah. They could take them. They could go that route. <laughs> but you're really inviting an open civil then war. It's like a three-side war. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's messed up at that point. They probably just shouldn't have withheld things from them. But yeah, yeah. From their point of view, they would argue the anarchists were being unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Whether <laughs> yeah, you could look at this multiple ways: the push for unity, or the crackdown of dissent. You know, whichever mm -hmm. way you want to look at it, it continues and it escalates from that point on. The republic starts centralizing more and more, taking control of the Catalan government and integrating the CNT and stuff, all those militias and everything. Integrating them into the Republican Army. Okay. So, like, officializing them more, yeah. training them more as a regular, disciplined army. Okay. They start banning newspapers that criticize them. They Oof. start disarming the people. Oof. I mean, you have a lot of people just running around with guns now. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know, enforcing the popular will directly. Mm -hmm. And they start disarming them. Mm -mm. And this leads us to the May Days, the May events. Okay. Which is in May of 1937. Okay. May 3rd through May 8th. This is the one where we talked about it near the end of the Spanish War, where the, or the Spanish Civil War, where the communists kind of do a little betrayal. Uh-oh. Okay. All right. Uh, so by this point, the government, the Republican government is dominated by the, the communists, the PCE. Yeah. And they decide they're going to go after the PUM, the other mm. communists that aren't with the Comintern. All right. They're also going after the CNT in Barcelona, the, the anarcho-syndicalist union. Okay. It's kind of a culmination of the centralizing thing they've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a part of the wider trend that Stalin was doing in mm. the USSR of his purges. Yeah. Honestly, he and the communist movement in, in particular, this government, may have thought that this was necessary. Mm, okay, just to get everyone in the party line. Yeah. To Ugh. me, it looks like an asshole move. Yeah, for sure. It's like, uh, this is frustrating because they just said, okay, we're we're trying to unify here. Mm -hmm. You can't unify if you're doing purchase. <laughs> I mean, I guess you'll get everyone thinking the same thing, but you'll have fewer people to fight on your side. Yeah, yeah. It's. I guess you'll be unified, but smaller. <laughs> right, yeah. I think that's, that's the downside. So, and... One of the reasons I think this is messed up is because, and we didn't do, I didn't do the best job of researching this before. Last time we characterized the Poom as a Trotskyist party. Okay. But they weren't really Trotskyists. They had okay. a couple leaders that like were influenced that way. Yeah. But they weren't officially like, you know, hey, we're Trotskyists. Mm -hmm. They were just Marxists. They were just communists, but okay. they weren't like following a Trotskyist line. This label of Trotskyist was actually used by the Communist Party for any Communist mm. Party that didn't obey the common term. Yeah, yeah. What they were doing at the time was claiming that Trotsky was not even really a communist. He was more of a fascist op. Oh, right? my and gosh. And so anyone accused of working with him was like, you know, in on it. They were part of the fascist what the fuck? How the... secret thing. They were, you know, in this case, working with Franco. How? How does that make sense? They clearly are fighting Franco. They just spread some gossip. They just say, you know, yeah, but look, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be doing so bad if, you know, if they weren't trying to, basically. Wow. Okay. The rundown of what happens here in the May days, the Republican army sends in troops okay. to Barcelona and they storm the telephone exchange. You know, in the old movies, they're yeah, like moving the wires board. around. Yeah. yeah. They storm that building and the anarchists in the city, they throw up barricades. Uh, and fighting breaks out between oh, the fuck. two sides. Okay. You know, the anarchists aren't ready to give this up. And the government's saying, no, you gotta. You know? And so people end up getting killed. Uh, the CNT, the anarchist union there, they are pleading, the leadership there is pleading with their people to put down their guns. And let's just have peace. Let's, let's give this to them. Mm -hmm. They're the government now. We got to do it. Yeah. You know? The people are like, fuck you, we're anarchists. And they, you know, keep <laughs> their guns. Tell me what to do. And eventually, yeah, and eventually the Republic brings in troops. They crush the militants brutally. Oh. Around 500 people end up getting killed. Okay. 
Shortly thereafter, the Republic ends up outlawing the Pum. Wow. And arresting its leader, Andrew Nin, the NKVD, the... The secret police guys? The secret police yeah. guys. They probably weren't cool about this, huh? They were not cool about this. So what they do once they've arrested the guy is they plant a letter on him written to Franco. Oh, no. They write it themselves in invisible ink, and then they're like, look at this guy's secret letter. Uh -huh. God, this is some fucking high school gossip shit. <laughs> this guy has a note confessing his crush. Well, so. they, they take it to the next level and torture and kill him. Oh, so. that's, yeah, that's not quite <laughs> the same. <laughs> but yes, yeah, they... Jesus. They totally planted on him. Sucks. The international communist movement at the time more or less believed that Stalin was trying to protect the movement from enemies all over, so more or less kind of believed that that story, mm -hmm. you know, his story was the official one. Not everyone, of course, there were independent parties out there. Yeah. But a large part of the, especially official common term parties were like, hmm. We had to do it. This yeah. guy clearly was a traitor. Yeah. That sucks. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, the war continued on poorly for mm -hmm. the Republic. By October 1937, the fascists had taken the north thanks to a brutal bombing campaign uh, against civilian targets. I mentioned Guernica and also Bilbao. Uh, just, I mean, flight after flight, just bombing the place. Jesus. They were also by that point at the gates of Madrid and Valencia, from which the government fled again to Barcelona. So wow. the government was really on the run. Yeah. A year later, the nationalists had split what remained of the Republic in two. Mm, Driven okay. in and separated Madrid and Barcelona, the Republic launched a last-ditch effort at the River Ebro in July of 1938, and it too failed. Ugh, okay. So their, uh, their pattern was terrible, so they would fight months, you know, and lose so many people in a battle to barely win and take control of some pretty insignificant place. Mm -hmm. And then, like, a month later, the Nationalists would roll in and take it in a week. Because mm, they were so, like, weak from the battle. Yeah. Jeez. So it was really a, a bloody war of attrition that the, that the Republic was losing. Yeah. They eventually sue for peace, and Franco refuses because he's like, I want an unconditional surrender. Wow. I want to defeat you guys. And does. It takes him two months in 1939 to take Catalonia. And by that point, he's recognized by the UK and France as the rightful government of Spain. Wow. Madrid held out, but not for long. By the end of March, they, the nationalists held all of Spanish territory. And most of the resistance, even in Madrid by that point, just crumbled. Yeah. They were just like... Shit. They were leaving. I mean, people were trying to run away as whatever that will they could. And... I mean, that was it. It's April 1st, 1939, that Franco gives a victory speech as the last of the Republicans surrendered. Wow. Fuck. Yeah. And then that guy did some really bad shit, I imagine. Oh, starting on day one, they immediately went out rounding up and executing all the Republicans they could find. I mean, or at least lots of them. We don't know how many, but at least 30,000. Wow. They put a bunch of them in concentration camps also. A lot of people fled to France, where they were also held in, like, internment camps there. Oh. Those who couldn't find any relatives in France, like so, if you had someone living in France, you go live with them. Uh -huh. But otherwise, you were they ended up encouraging them to go back to Spain. Oh fuck! Where they were just arrested by the government and yeah. put in concentration camps. Okay. The ones who did end up remaining in France, like the ones who said nah to that, but who didn't have any family in France, eventually the Nazis came in and conquered. Yeah, yeah. France so it's not so, like they had a great time there either. So a terrible time. Vichy France uh, deported these guys to Nazi Germany. Oh fuck! They put around five thousand Spaniards who died in the Thousand in concentration camps. Oh my god, okay. In Germany, so, yeah. Okay, Terrible I thought fate. they were just going to get run out because France was about to get taken over, but no, nope. they shipped them out. Yeah. That's so fucked. Mm-hmm. that was the immediate aftermath. As you go on, Franco in power, terrible guy, very repressive. He had become, during the course of the war, dictator of that side, mm -hmm. you know, and so by this point, he's, he's dictator of Spain. He had reunited all the right-wing parties into one, called the Fet y de los Hons. That's okay. just kind of the abbreviation for it. They're assholes. Okay. Fascists, conservative sort of thing, yeah. basically. Yeah. They kind of transition to being called Spanish Catholic authoritarianism. That's really bad. <laughs> but it's not, you know, way nicer than fascism, I guess. I mean, barely. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like 
uh, during World War II when fascism is sort of like slipping on its way out. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> they're like, we don't want to be yeah, that. Yeah, we don't have to say that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, geez. Mm, this was all part of the kind of governmental group that Franco put together called the National Movement. The sole legal party was that one, the Fete de los Hans. Mm -hmm. The sole mandatory trade union was the OSE, the Spanish Syndical Organization. Okay. It was just a uh, fake labor. It was government run. It mm -hmm. was included your boss like it was bad. Yeah. 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 It was just to make sure you complied with your boss. Okay. Yeah. It's almost more like a Department of Labor, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Department of Employers, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that sucks. Everything else was banned, like all political parties, communist and anarchist Ooh. organizations, trade unions like the CNT and the UGT, those all went underground. Mm. Uh, everything, I mean, like languages, Catalan, Galician, Basque, they were suppressed Fuck. in legal documents and schools and ads and signs. And you can still speak it, but like, mm -hmm. you know, officially, you couldn't use it. Civil servants all had to be Catholic. Oh, okay. They reestablished Catholicism as the official state church. Fuck. Um, <laughs> Guys, yeah. this is 1940. You don't need those anymore. Well, they did. They uh, nullified civil marriages from the Republic. Wow. They outlawed divorce. Um, Fuck. I've heard accounts of that they would sometimes uh, force women who had divorced their husbands before to go like back to live with them oh fuck no to be remarried to them basically that's some gilead shit right there yeah probably inspirations probably. i don't know the i don't know the timeline on that <laughs> uh they also outlawed contraceptives and abortion yeah yep they also Charms. criminalized homosexuality and prostitution or sex work women obviously were put back in, you know, put back in their traditional patriarchal place mm -hmm. of being told their place within the family and motherhood. Uh, they couldn't even open bank accounts without their father or husband. Jesus. Okay. I assume they lost suffrage as well. Uh, no, oh. I think suffrage was kept. Rat. You can vote, but you can't do anything Well, you can else. vote for one party. I mean, yeah. You <laughs> vote for one party. So, oh God. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. I guess. I think they did keep that though. There's, there was this interesting group called the Spanish Maquis mm -hmm. uh, that it was like this militant guerrilla rebel group that okay. kept on fighting against Franco after the Civil War. They also helped fight against the Nazis in Vichy, France. I don't know much about them. Like, I didn't spend mm -hmm. a lot of time researching on them other than what they basically did. It might be interesting to research later. They look kind of cool, like, on the surface. I mean, mm -hmm. fuck Franco. So yeah, that was fuck cool. Franco, fuck Nazis. So, like, yeah, good start. <laughs> yeah. They hate the people I hate. Yeah. <laughs> they lasted from the end of the war till 1965, oh, when they wow. basically like gave up the fight yeah. pretty much. Franco, only the good die young, remained dictator for life. Uh, he actually was made regent, like, so. Oh, okay, so he got what he wanted, huh? Well, it's like uh, in 1947, they brought back the mo monarchy, <laughs> but they said Franco gets to choose the next king and until then he's regent. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> that's insane. So yeah, dictator for life. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, <laughs> he ended up choosing the son of King Alfonso. Remember before? Mm, yeah. Not the son, but his son, okay. so his grandson, I guess. A fellow named Juan Carlos de Bourbon. Oh gosh, a bourbon. And yeah, mm -hmm. and that uh, is who kind of ended up succeeding him. He mm -hmm. didn't choose his father, who was still alive. Uh, because he thought that his father was too liberal. Yeah. And he was like, oh, I'm going to pick this guy and kind of groom him to not be so liberal. Ugh. Uh, but it turns out okay. Franco eventually finally fucking died on November 20th, 1975. Fuck yeah. Mark that on your calendars if you're looking for some extra excuse to celebrate. For real, yeah. Everyone crack one open on November or whatever. November 20th. There you <laughs> yeah. go. Actually, you know, I mean, people were celebrating when he had died. Uh, not everyone. <laughs> because there were still like a lot of fans of his regime and stuff. I'm sure. But yeah, he died then. And then after that, Spain began a transition to democracy. Okay. It's a constitutional monarchy, but still it's like, um, yeah. you know, the leftist parties now are legal again. The trade unions are legal as well. It's more or less a liberal democracy now because that guy that he named actually was cool with you know, oh, okay. doing liberal democracy. He was like, Oof. that's good. Kind of looked out there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they had a, you know, a series of prime ministers after him that kind of helped that yeah. transition go more smoothly. Wow. That is the Spanish Civil War. That's crazy. And it's aftermath. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is this our discussion time now? Yeah, discussion time. Discussion time. Okay. So one thing 
I mean, we talked a lot already during this whole thing about like just the idea of unifying the left and like how that is such a big theme. I mean, basically yeah. in every fucking episode, but this one like really <laughs> brought it home. And yeah. one of the most frustrating parts about this one was when they dropped the social revolution component. Yeah. And yeah, to me that goes hand in hand and it it reminds me a lot of like this is a super common trend in basically all revolutions, even like we've talked about the American Revolution, like they kinda like just scooted slavery to the side, scooted women's rights to the side and was like, Well, we're we're gonna do this first and then like surprise fucking surprise, it takes a long time to get to those things. Yeah. And <laughs> in that case it's more of like a coup than a rebel it's, it's more of a rebellion than a revolution. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I just see that as a common theme in almost any fight. Just the the stupidity of incrementalism of like, no, we've got to address this first and then we'll get to your quote unquote special interest. And it's like, they're all tied together. It's all holistic. Like that's why we've done episodes on like queer theory. Like it's, it's holding up that system. So yeah. like, might as well just fucking take it out. Yeah. Um, how? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know, but it's it's frustrating when people present it as like a we have to focus on just one thing at a time. Like that is just yeah, that, not how I roll. I think they think that because they're approaching it from a parliamentary, mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of democratic stance of like, oh well, we're gonna not democratic, but yeah, parliamentary. Like they 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 say, well, we got to get one thing passed and then we'll do the next thing. And but they don't even do that. Like in bills, there's always like crazy writers and like it's always a package of things. So. That's because it's things that they actually want to do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> ridiculous. Um, no, 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 no. I think when you're thinking outside of that box and you're thinking, well, what if we arm the people? What if we have you know a true workers' commune or dictatorship of the proletariat or what, however you want to call it, the libertarian commune? Because you know. Uh, people want to say, "Oh, you're a you know Marxist-Leninist, you're a statist because you want a dictatorship or the mm -hmm. proletariat." That was run by like the anarcho-syndicalists <laughs> doing that. I mean, that was them arming the people and doing their revolutionary communes. Yeah. So, but if you take that approach and are like, "Okay, this is how it's going to be done," as long as you are in touch with the people and this is what the people want, it is better to just change it than to like piss off some of your base for not doing something. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this kind of gets back to the unified left question in general, is that, like well, that analogy before with, with like the gay bars in small towns, it's like you can fucking can't afford to lose people at this point. Yeah. So like, keep them happy. Whatever mm -hmm. the fuck they want, they get. <laughs> and you know, the, the, I've got a lot of differences, pretty much every difference that you can imagine with mm -hmm. the Republican Party in the United States. Yes. They're assholes. Yes. But they get keeping their base happy. They know how to do that. And they don't fucking fraction. They don't, you know, no. even, they, they might be like, oh, maybe we'll do a third, but they don't. They don't break off. They never they, do. They stick together because they know that their, their party is going to look after their side. Yeah. And like, they lost like 10 Bush people. That's yeah. about it. <laughs> 10, yeah, yeah. 10 aristocrats. That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if if we, our movement were to be successful, we would have to be looking out for ourselves, our mm -hmm. people. And I think we have more in common with, you know, the working class and the masses in America. And I think this mostly translates in other countries. The common people have more in common with the left than with the right. Yeah. On yeah. issues that matter, you know. One thing that I thought was kind of interesting slash scary is that Franco is a totally reactionary movement. And I think, I don't know, do you think that would happen if we had kind of a slightly more unified left and like we started taking shit over? Like there would definitely be a, would there be a scary reactionary fascist movement? I mean, there would definitely be a state movement, which, uh, I mean, there'd be police state shit going on. I think a big part of the rise of Franco was the instability before. Mm -hmm. So if that part comes, you know, comes to pass as well, then yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I mean, it almost makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, I mean, I hate what the guy did. I think he's an asshole, but I can almost see why regular people not really trying to tune in, especially the more well-to-do people for whom this was just a big disturbance. Yeah, yeah. Could turn they to somebody like that and say like, well, he's going to set things like back in order again. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got every two years the government changes out and fights each other like i mean you've got multiple coups going off all over the place street fighting all this like 
there's got to be some people who are like, yeah, I want this fixed. And, right. and their version of fixed is back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, um, like you, your question, if we had more of a strong, like a stronger left movement. Yeah, because it seemed like that's kind of when he really rapidly rose to power was whenever like shit started popping off and people were like expropriating land and shit like that. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I think that probably would would spur on more of a right wing reaction. Yeah, if they, I mean, they're reacting now, and it's like again, Joe Biden in charge. <laughs> you so guys like, run the place, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you're so mad, but okay. <laughs> I don't know. Those are my main points. Is it's just really interesting to see how the fracturing and unification affects these larger movements and like the global stage part of it. Like, mm. I'm really, as usual, I'm pissed at Stalin for fucking around and making things worse. Yeah. That guy sucks. I, I mean, he made things worse after he made things better. He made things, yeah, he should have just kept doing that, though. Like, why yeah. change it? <laughs> because, I, so I think that Spain was not his primary goal. Mm -hmm. Spain was part of his foreign policy, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union's foreign policy. And what he was looking at was, on the one hand, trying to, and they, this actually comes through in, like, the research and papers and stuff is, He's trying to, on the one hand, like prop Spain up and help them because he doesn't like Franco and doesn't want fascism to yeah. win a victory. And he wants to drain resources from Nazi Germany and, and Italy. Yeah. But he also doesn't want to, at the time, he was still trying to put together a pact, of, an anti-fascist pact against mm. Germany. Okay. And so he's still trying to get Britain and France to kind of like him enough for that to uh, happen. Oh, so he couldn't like outwardly support them too much? And he can't outwardly support them too much, yeah, specifically for like... A, putting together a communist republic. Yeah, you know, yeah. That'd be like, a little too much for them. Yeah. Okay. So he, he's also kind of deviously playing this other game, which makes sense from his interest point, but yeah, turns yeah. out from this point of view to be really bad. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's the complicated story with history is you, you, you come across some assholes and a lot of times they do have like motivations that make sense for them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But they still suck. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thinks they're a good guy, but no. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, that's an interesting point about the international aid, because like, we saw them try to do some, oh, what do we do this to help the Western democracies like us? And it just, just didn't work. It just doesn't work. You know? Just give up. <laughs> it won't help you. They're arrayed against you. <laughs> Another point I thought was interesting was that the Spanish Republic got dominated by its own imperial army. Yes, yes. Like, that's the biggest danger to any sort of left movement is... We've got a hundred bases, more than a hundred bases all around the world. They'll come the fuck right back home if something pops off here. Yeah. Um, but only for if, if it's the left doing it. They didn't give a shit if, if it's the right get, doing it. They might show up to give tours. Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll show up to help them. Open up the Air Force bases. <laughs> hey, you guys want to check out the Apache helicopters? Again, crazy how there's like a pipeline from military people to like far right fascism. Nuts. What a coinky thing. That's crazy. It doesn't have to happen. I mean, it doesn't. A lot of, I mean, you do have people who like become radicalized through that. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's a danger. It's, Empire it's a coming trend. home, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And they definitely, they face the losing end of that one. Oof, of yeah. Well, thank you for teaching me this. Can I have a cat now? Yeah, you can have a cat now. Oh, you were yes. a good enough student. Yes. Okay, you asked great. questions. You brought up good points. <laughs> good. Good. I cannot wait. <laughs> so, next time, uh, what do you, I think you're doing a report. What do you want to report <laughs> on? We're going to do another art history one, because I love those, and it's been a while. Yeah. So... I think people liked our last one. Yeah. It's fun. I almost majored in art history at one point, so I've got a soft spot for it. There you go. I'm still TBH formulating my plan, but I want to take a look at basically the art movement as it relates to the labor movement. Things like the Works Progress Administration and like how they hired a bunch of muralists and things like that. Okay. Also the Mexican muralism movement and how that related to socialism. So tune in to see how that <laughs> ends up being broken down into a, a unified topic. So <laughs> we'll awesome. see. Maybe next week I'll be like, no, we're talking about this one guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll find out so yeah that's what we think we're doing something with art <laughs> it's gonna be there's gonna be a pretty slideshow on on social awesome <laughs> okay so in the meantime you can find us online we are on twitter at teach communism instagram at teach me communism you can send us an email teach me communism at gmail.com 
that's uh, where you can send us a question or a uh, suggestion for a future episode. And you should leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That is a great way to help people find the show. Rate and review. I love it. Help, yeah. help out our egos. Please, I need it. <laughs> it's about to be my birthday, so you fucking have to. <laughs> it's my birthday month. We also have a YouTube, if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts, or if you know someone, they're like, what's a podcast? I only do YouTube. Then send, them, send them our shit. <laughs> and we have Patreon. And for five bucks a month, you can get access to our notes. This time, you'll get Grady's notes. I have been seeing them out of the corner of my eye. They look very robust. Lots of links. Lots of hot links for you. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a fan of robustness and hot links. Hot links. <laughs> like sausages? Yeah. Yeah. Just... <laughs> Then, uh, then yeah, these are the notes for you. Great. Uh, you also get access to our backlog, uh, which I reference all the time. It's a useful little document. Yeah, it is. And at the end of the year, we'll be donating the money from that to a local mutual aid fund. So yeah, sign up for that. And I think that's it. I think that's it. Thanks for being a great student. Thanks. And thank you guys, you listeners out there for all that you do. Tune in next week to another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye. Bye, y'all.